Okay, so best test from our lab yesterday at determining whether an unknown compound is ionic or molecular would be to test conductivity. Okay, um, if something has a pH of less than 7, it is a acid. I should have done this because obviously a would have been for base. N would be for acid, but anyway, that's how I understand it anyway. Me, English, not good. Okay. All right, uh, number three, you add a sample of unknown compound to water, and the solution turns blue. What metal does this compound contain? Copper. Okay, uh, names of the following compounds. So, number four, we've got an ionic compound containing a metal and a polyatomic ion. So, since it's ionic, numbers don't matter in the name. This stuff is calcium nitrate, no capital letters. Okay, for number five, I've got silicone and I've got oxygen. Those are both non-metals, so I do need the prefixes. Disilicon trioxide. They don't have to have the hyphen if they just went trioxide, that's fine. Questions on those? Okay, for number six, I've got lead with oxygen. That's an ionic compound because lead is a metal. Lead is also a multivalent metal, and so we need a Roman numeral in this name. Okay, oxygen is always minus two, so there's four negatives in this compound, which means this is the lead with the four plus charge. All right, so lead, IV, oxide. All right, and our last one, we've got potassium with phosphorus. It's an ionic compound, so we don't need prefixes, and this is simply potassium phosphide. Okay, questions on any of those? Over number six. Okay, so when I've got um, a multivalent metal that needs a Roman numeral because it's got more than one charge, I go to the non-metal because non-metals only ever have one charge. Okay, oxygen's charge is minus two, and there's two oxygens in this compound. Right. So if each oxygen has a negative two charge, that gives me four negatives. And in an ionic compound, we have to add up to zero, so the charge on lead has to be plus four. Okay. All right, for the name or for the uh, formula part here, sulfur dichloride prefix automatically tells me it's a molecular compound. There's only one sulfur, but there are two chlorines. For number nine, we got magnesium phosphide. Magnesium is a metal, so we're dealing with an ionic compound. Magnesium's charge is two plus. Phosphide's charge is minus three, so we drop and swap Mg three P two is our formula there. Alright, for number 10, we got cobalt 2 nitride. Remembering that the 2 tells me what charge to use on cobalt in the swap and drop. So it's the 2 plus. Nitride is minus 3. So we got CO3 N2. And number 11, we got sodium carbonate, another ionic compound. Sodium is a plus one. Carbonate's a polyatomic ion, CO3, and it has a minus two charge. So the one goes there, and the two goes down to here, and that's what we're left with. We don't need brackets because we didn't need to put another number beside the three. Okay, give them a mark out of 11. Let them see it. Double check your name is on it before you put it in the box, please. All right, uh, so we got solubility and the properties of water. All right, so we got some terminology that we need to learn related to solubility, um, just some terms that we have to know. And then we got to talk about what's meant by the term polar molecule. Kennedy, can I get you to can, can I turn off that front one for me? Thanks. Okay, now this is a really important term because that, guys, comes up in two units in Science 10. 
right? It's going to come up in this unit when we talk about its kind of chemical nature, but it's also going to come up in the biology unit when we talk about how plants transport water. We'll talk a little bit about how it's involved in that today, but we'll go into way more detail on how it's involved in that in biology. So understanding and being able to tell me what it means to be a polar molecule is crucial. Right? I cannot remember the last time I didn't ask that to be explained on a unit exam. Okay, so make sure you know what it means to be polar. Explain what that is, okay, and tell me maybe something like how, how it can affect things. Okay, um, and then obviously because it's a polar molecule, water has many important and unique properties that make life on Earth possible. Right, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Okay, questions so far? All right. Um, now, sometimes you get substances that dissolve easily. Okay. Yesterday I told you that substance B in the um, in the lab was a crystalline solid originally, but I dissolved it in water for you. Actually, I didn't dissolve it in water. Northwest Scientific or Pasco or whoever we bought that stuff from dissolved it for you. Okay. Um, but it's highly soluble in water. Okay. I could put a lot of it in water, and a lot of it would dissolve. Okay. And uh, and so we would say that that would have a high degree of solubility or it would be highly soluble. Okay, so solubility is essentially the extent to which something will dissolve in something else. It's not always water. Okay? Often it's water. That's why we call water the universal solvent. It dissolves lots and lots of things, but not everything. Right? Obviously sometimes we want to find things that don't dissolve in water. Okay. If we want to protect, let's say, exterior parts of our home or our vehicles, we usually put what on them? What do you put on your deck or your, if you have a wooden fence, you might put it on your fence. Yeah, stain or paint. Okay. Why do we do that? Because we need to protect it from water. We don't want the water to get in there because water will cause it to rot and things like that. So we put stuff on it that seals water out, that water can't dissolve, okay? that water can't get through. Right? If, you, um, if you look sometimes at, uh, at people's vehicles, sometimes when it rains, some people's vehicles, they got the beads of water sitting on the, on the hood. Okay? In other ones, it's just kind of a sheen. Right? If they've got beads of water on the hood, it means that the hood has been waxed. Okay. Someone has put, essentially, I mean, it, we call it wax. It's not really candle wax, but it's a type of wax okay, that you put on that seals water out. Water can't dissolve it. Okay? And since water can't dissolve it, it can't get inside at your paint where it could rust your, uh, or eat through your paint, rust the metal your car is made out of, things like that. So we have to have things around that are not soluble in water. All right. Does that sort of make sense? All right, uh, so a substance is said to be insoluble if it will not dissolve in another substance. Okay? Uh, if the substance remains insoluble, then we call it a precipitate. Oftentimes, precipitates can be formed during a chemical reaction. When we do the reaction stuff, I'll actually show you a chemical reaction. And actually, in our reactions lab, we'll have two reactions that produce solids. You'll mix two clear solutions together, and a solid will form. Now, I'm not saying like it'll turn into a chunk and plunk onto the table, okay? But like when you mix the two together, they'll go from being a clear, two clear solutions to some liquid with a, a powder inside. Okay, a solid will kind of magically form out of nowhere, right? And that's because in the reaction, something was formed that doesn't dissolve in water. Okay? And it falls out of the solution almost like snow. And that's where we get the name precipitate from. It appears to kind of fall out of the solution in the same way that precipitation falls out of the sky. Right? That's why we call it that, because it kind of falls out of the solution and down to the bottom. Is that making sense to everybody? Any terminology-wise? All right. All right, so a solution is a mixture that contains a solute dissolved in a solvent. Okay, so a solute is the thing that gets dissolved. Solvent is the thing that's doing the dissolving, which is why we often call cleaners, like, uh, you know, Mr. Clean or...
Tilex or you know or CLR okay, things like that those are solvents they help us to dissolve things all right things that maybe water can't dissolve very quickly on its own so we add a little bit of that stuff to the water it makes the water wetter and, and stuff dissolves better okay and and we can get the crud off the inside of the shower okay or whatever it is that we're trying to clean okay a true solution has only one visible part okay and if something has only one visible part we call it homogeneous okay that's what the prefix homo means okay the prefix homo goes on anything that only has one particular part okay you're probably all thinking this so I'll put it out there for you okay in a homosexual couple there's only how many genders one okay homo means one if you are drinking uh, like milk that's homogenized it's that it's been put through a process where it won't separate okay the cream won't rise to the top and everything else sink to the bottom it's homogenized so it stays as one part okay um, you can get uh, peanut butter same thing Right? If you get like fully natural peanut butter, it's not homogenized. So if you go to like, you know, the the natural food store or whatever, and you get real peanut butter, you have to stir it before you can spread it on your sandwich because it separates. The oil goes to the top, and the rest of it goes to the bottom. Okay, it's not homogenized, so it won't stay as one visible part. Does that make sense, to everybody? Okay. Whereas if something is heterogeneous, it has two or more visible parts. Okay, so if something is heterogeneous, it means it probably didn't dissolve, and as a result, the two parts will separate. We oftentimes will also call that a mechanical mixture. Okay, and this doesn't necessarily have to be a solid and a liquid. A mechanical mixture could be several solids or several liquids. Okay, if I was to put water and oil and you know let's say I'm trying to think of something else that would go in there glycerin okay something like that I, I they would all separate into three di three different distinct parts all right so that would be a heterogeneous um, mixture all right a mechanical mixture could be something like uh, I, like I've got the example here iron filings in sand all right so if I take a you know a, a jar and I put iron filings in sand and shake it up obviously they don't dissolve in one another right there's this mixture that's got sand and iron filings all mixed together the thing about a mechanical mixture is you can separate the parts of a mechanical mixture by a physical means okay so if i wanted to separate iron filings from sand how would i do it okay a lot easier i could do it with tweezers if i wanted to do that for the rest of my life I could do it I pick each little piece out or every little grain of sand but it would take a long time there's probably one faster way a magnet I could just jam a old bar magnet into that mixture and stir it around like this and pretty soon all the iron filings would be stuck to the magnet and all the salmon stay in the jar right I could use some physical property of one of them to separate it from the other you can do that in a mechanical mixture okay in a homogeneous mixture you can't the only way to separate them would be to boil off the water. If you evaporated all the water, you would leave behind whatever was dissolved in it. If you've accidentally ever left water boiling on the stove, you've seen what happens when that happens. Okay? If you leave it boiling, the water all evaporates and all the minerals that were in the water burn onto the bottom of the pan and the whole house stinks to high heaven for quite a while. Okay? Because those minerals just char right and basically that pan is a lost cause you almost never get it clean after so be careful about doing that okay make sure you don't leave water on too long all right is that making sense the difference there okay difference between a homogeneous mixture and a heterogeneous mixture all right because those are two terms we're definitely going to need to know Okay, so solute and solvent, okay? A solute is the substance that's getting dissolved. If you pour salt into water, salt is the solute. Okay, and the solvent, like we said before, is the thing that's doing the dissolving. For us, most of the time, that's going to be water. But if you've ever done any painting with stain, oil-based stain, 
you can't get that off of your fingers with soap and water. So what do you use instead? No, you can't get it off with soap and water. You have to use... Mm -hmm. Okay, you can use sugar and water together for a couple of reasons. Sugar's grainy, okay, and it'll help to take some of it off. Um, but the other part of it is that sugar is not a polar molecule. So when you put it in the solution, okay, it helps to make that uh, material soluble. An even better way to do it would be to use paint thinner, all right, or Varsol, or even, not that I would recommend you do this, gasoline, okay. If you, don't, don't go pouring gasoline on your hands. Okay. Especially near open flames, not a good idea. All right. But it will dissolve other non-polar, um, like oil-based substances. All right. um, I once got on my clothes some grease, and I, you know, it was like a brand new shirt, and I got grease on it. And I was trying to figure out how to get this out. I'm like, well, you know, I could spray it with all those funny cleaners and whatever. And then I got to thinking, wait a minute, it's oily. If I had another oil... I could probably get it out of there. It would probably dissolve. I ended up using baby oil. Put a little bit of baby oil on the grease, and it just disappeared. Okay, came right out. All right, it, it dissolved in the baby oil, and then, since baby oil is actually a little bit more soluble in water than, than the grease was, soap and water, baby oil came out. Okay, so it, you just have to sometimes find a solvent that what you're trying to dissolve is soluble in. All right, does that make sense? Right, so it's sometimes, and most of the time it's going to be water, but sometimes it won't be. Okay, so a precipitate is any solid that's produced in a reaction and will not dissolve in the solution. So we talked about how you get uh, this precipitate that kind of falls out of the solution, okay, like snow falls out of the sky. Okay, I'll show you a quick video of that, but I can't. All right, so there you see kind of what a precipitate looks like when it forms. Okay. Um, now, definition of solubility, okay, it's the, strictly, it's the degree to which a substance will dissolve in another substance. Obviously, you can't just keep adding something to something else and hope that it'll just forever dissolve. Eventually, you reach a point where no more will, will dissolve. We call that saturated, okay? So when you can't get any more to dissolve, it becomes saturated, okay? Now, there are some things that can affect the solubility. I think I was telling you guys the other day how I make Kool-Aid, okay? When you make Kool-Aid, if you use warm water, you can get more of the sugar to dissolve because temperature affects solubility. The hotter the solvent is, the more solute will dissolve in it. Now, as you cool that solution, its solubility decreases, and stuff will start to precipitate out, namely the sugar, which gives you that yummy little sugary layer on the bottom. Okay, that tells you your solution of Kool-Aid is saturated, okay? and you would not be able to get any more sugar to dissolve. Now, some things are soluble in water that shouldn't be, like Twinkies. Okay, now, originally, many, many moons ago, Twinkies were made of things that pastry is supposed to be made out of. Eggs, oil, flour, okay, think you know, butter and stuff like that. Things that are like natural, right? But not anymore, because when you make them out of natural things, they spoil more quickly. So they want Twinkies to ha last a long time on the shelf. And they want them to be easier to make, so they don't have to, you know, have all this mixing and everything going on. So they got stuff that mixes together much more easily, and essentially will last forever, right? So that a Twinkie won't go moldy on the shelf, right? Um, so anyway, they replaced some of the stuff. They replaced the eggs, right, with sort of a an agar kind of nutrient thing that has a consistency like eggs, but it it's not eggs. Now. What color is a Twinkie? Golden. Where is it supposed to get that golden color from? The eggs. It's supposed to get the golden color from the eggs. But when you don't use eggs to make it, the Twinkie has the same color as drywall. It's gray. No one is going to buy a gray Twinkie. All right. So what do they do? Well, we replace the eggs. We lost the color of the eggs. So we'll add yellow dye number five. Okay. Anyone? 
Yellow dye number five is really, really bad for you. Okay? It's like it's banned in Europe. They they can't even put it in food in Europe. Okay? It's a known carcinogen, but we put it in Twinkies anyway. Keep that in mind. Okay? But it's soluble in water. So is the the egg replacement. All right? Uh, they don't want to use milk, right? Because milk can spoil, right? So they use different types of sugars and lactoses and things like that that are also soluble in water, right? Um, not as many oils or different types of oils, weird ones that are almost that are soluble in water. So what ends up happening is if you put a modern Twinkie in a glass of water, it'll dissolve. Not immediately, but after a little while, you'll have that. Looks like vomited Twinkie, but okay, it's soluble in water, all of it. Right. Originally, not so. Right. You can't put like cake that you make at home in water. It doesn't dissolve. Okay. It, it turns to mush, but it doesn't dissolve. Okay. It doesn't become a, a cake solution. All right. Yeah. Where, now, if you had a broken jaw and you really wanted a Twinkie, you could put it in water, and then in a little while you could drink it with a straw. Yuck. <laughs> What's that? Right, it's not made with butter anymore. It's made with, you know, like, you know, certain oily substitutes. And sugar, of course, soluble in water. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit scary, actually. Yeah, because one of the things they use in this to keep it from, from molding is very similar to the same stuff that morticians use to keep corpses from getting smelly. Yeah, it's... It's very similar to, to mortician's fluid, all right? I mean, hey, it keeps bacteria and fungus from growing. Just do you want to eat it? I don't know. Okay. And I'm not one of those, ooh, i got to eat all this organic stuff. I'm not like that at all. But it just always look at the ingredients. If there are a lot of things in something that you can't pronounce, it might not be all that good for you. Okay. All right. Now, on the back of your periodic table, so everyone can take out their periodic table. On the back of your periodic table is a solubility chart. That's what this thing is. You'll see it there. Okay, so this is a chart that allows us to determine whether a compound is soluble in water or not. Okay, the reason that we need to know this is when we get to Chem 20, and we're predicting the products of a reaction, we also have to be able to predict the state they will be in as a product. Okay? You don't have to do that in Science 10, but in Chem 20, you've got to be able to say, this stuff will be a liquid, this stuff will be a gas, this stuff will be aqueous, which means dissolved in water, this stuff will be a solid, okay? so maybe a precipitate, based on its solubility. All right, so here's what we do. First off, we're going to scribble out this part about solubility greater than, solubility less than. We're just going to say very soluble, and slightly, or you might want to write not soluble, okay? So if I want to figure out if, let's say, potassium phosphate is soluble in water or not, okay? I go along the top and I find phosphate. Here's phosphate right here. All right. So this is the column for phosphate. It says that phosphate is soluble with hydrogen, sodium, potassium, and ammonium. All right. I was looking for potassium phosphate, so I know that potassium phosphate is soluble in water. All right. Almost everything else is not. Okay. So if I had anything else with phosphate, it would probably be a precipitate okay, in a solution. Everyone follow me on that? So basically that's what you do. You look for the anion, okay, the non-metal or the polyatomic ion that's negatively charged. You look for that on the top, and then you look down below, and you say, oh, sulfate's soluble with most things, but if it was with calcium, strontium, barium, mercury, lead, or silver, it wouldn't be. Okay, those things would make precipitates. Now, that's going to be important for us in our reactions lab, because... When we combine two things in the reactions lab, we're going to need to predict the products. And some of those products might not be soluble in water. And we would need to know which one. So 
if we write out the chemical reaction and go, okay, here's the two things that were produced, um, one of them may one of them is soluble and one of them isn't, we could use this chart to figure out which one is not soluble. All right, and we're going to get two um, reactions where that's going to happen. And one will produce a bright yellow precipitate, and one will produce a very pale white precipitate. Okay, but they'll both be very obvious, especially the bright yellow one. All right, everyone, follow me there. Okay, on how this works. All right, I want you guys to tell me. Just write these examples down, and tell me whether they are soluble or insoluble. Just write S or I beside them using your solubility chart. Yeah, I'll give you a couple minutes on that and then we'll go through them. All right, so for um, lithium fluoride, okay, so if I go and look for fluoride, the negatively charged thing, okay, column for fluoride is right here. It says it's soluble with most things, but lithium is down here in the not soluble row, so lithium fluoride is not soluble. Okay, uh, number two, we got sodium sulfate. All right, so we go up here. Here's sulfate, soluble with most things. I don't see sodium down here in the not soluble row, so sodium must be included in most. All right, um, ammonium nitrate. Okay, just so you know, in general, almost all nitrates are soluble. Okay, like I can't think of a, a single case where that wouldn't be true, okay, except with these incredibly complex ions, which we would never deal with. All right, so you can see NO3 is up here, nitrate, okay, and it's actually up here with ammonium, so they are soluble with each other for sure. Okay, uh, silver chloride. Okay, silver is often listed with things that make precipitates. All right, so silver chloride, so here's chlorine, soluble with most things, but silver's down here. Okay, and you can see that silver is in many of these not soluble rows. Okay. All right. Um, for number five, we've got lead two iodide, and it's important that we know which lead it is because lead four and lead two have different solubilities. Right. So we have to actually look and see which charge we're dealing with. Okay. So uh, we've got uh, it was lead two iodide, right? So we got iodine right here, soluble with most things. But we see that lead with the 2 plus charge is down here in the not soluble row. Okay, we've got hydrogen sulfide. Okay, sulfide is over here. Okay, and we see that hydrogen is listed in the soluble row. All right, we got potassium phosphate, which we actually did as an example. So we got potassium is right here, soluble with phosphate. Okay, and uh, mercury 2 chloride. Well, here's chloride, soluble with most things, but not with mercury too. Okay, everybody with me there? All right, so that's pretty straightforward. Everyone can use that. I'll usually have a couple of multiple choice questions on the unit exam. Say, hey, is this compound soluble or not? And you flip to your solubility chart and just check it out. Those are pretty easy questions. Okay, now, when we talk about... Um, bonding of compounds. We talked about how molecular compounds share their electrons. Well, water is a molecular compound. It has what we call covalent bonds, which means the electrons are being shared between hydrogen and oxygen. The issue here is that the sharing isn't equal. Right? Yes, they're sharing the electrons, but the electrons spend more time near oxygen than they do near the hydrogen. And what that ends up doing is making one end of the molecule appear slightly positive and makes the other end of the molecule appear slightly negative. Okay? That's why we call it polar. It has opposite ends, like the Earth has a north and south pole. Okay? Does everyone follow me on that? Okay, so we have how um, electrons or atoms of different elements can form the compounds. Electrons can be gained or lost. Okay, when nonmetals collide, they share them. Okay, so you can see here that we've got oxygen down below. Right, it's got eight protons and it's got eight electrons, but it is sharing two from or one from each hydrogen, so two in total. Okay, now this is a pretty accurate kind of depiction of where those electrons are going to spend the bulk of their time. Normally, an electron would orbit hydrogen like so. It would go around and around in an orbit like this. But 
oxygen is really what we call electronegative. If you look on your periodic table, one of the numbers in each element's box is its electronegativity. It's right under the atomic number. Right? If you look at oxygen, oxygen's electronegativity is 3.4. Right? There are very few things that are more electronegative than oxygen. Fluorine would be one of them. Okay? It's 4.0. Electronegativity is a description of how tightly an atom holds on to electrons. Right? Oxygen is greedy. It wants lots of them, and it holds onto them very, very tightly. So when it bonds with hydrogen atoms, instead of the hydrogen atoms following this orbit, they actually end up doing more like this. They don't even sometimes go all the way around the hydrogen atom's nucleus. They spend more time near oxygen because it's cooler. Okay? It's more electronegative, and it want, they want to hang out there more often. So what ends up happening is you got these two protons sticking out the top of this molecule, right? Kind of like you know Mickey Mouse, right, with the two ears. Okay? So they stick out there at the top, but they're protons, so they're positive, and they make the top of that molecule seem positive or positively charged. Meanwhile, there's all these electrons hanging out down here with oxygen, making the bottom of this molecule appear negative. Okay. Now, when you have a molecule like that, we call it polar, but there's some things that can happen. Like things repel each other, and opposites attract. So water can attract other water molecules. So down here would be attracted to the positive part of other water molecules. Right? And when that happens, they can form what's called a hydrogen bond. Right? It's a weak bond, but they can bond to each other slightly, almost like an ionic bond, because it's a charge balancing thing. Okay? But they'll bond there, and they'll stick together. Okay? So we'll talk about some examples of where we see that happening sometimes. All right, so like we said, the sharing is not always equal. Okay? So that's kind of important to know. The sharing of electrons is not always equal. When it's not equal, we have a polar covalent bond. Now, in a polar covalent bond, we said the electrons aren't shared equally, so we see that these, this end here is slightly positive, and up here, slightly negative. And there's almost like two slightly negative spots okay, on the bottom of that molecule, because oxygen's kind of big. Right? Now, what happens between those slightly positive and slightly negative areas is hydrogen bonding. Okay? And um, hydrogen bonding is responsible for some of the things that water does that are weird. Okay? How many, if you uh, take a flat rock and you throw it kind of sideways across a lake, what does it do? Yeah. Why? Why doesn't it just plunge into the water? It's more dense than water. How can you bounce something off a liquid? Okay, it's partly that. It's partly the speed the rock is traveling at. What's that? Right, the skin on the top of the water. It's not really a skin, but it's almost like a skin. And it's the result of these water molecules making hydrogen bonds between them. It's surface tension. You guys heard that term before? Okay. Surface tension is the result of hydrogen bonds. It's why you can fill a glass with water slightly above its fill point. Right? Because when you get it there, the hydrogen bonds are strong enough to support that column of water. Not very big but enough to support at least a small column of water above the top of the glass. Right? And in fact, if you're really good, you can apparently get a paper clip to sit on it. I tried for a long time and it never worked, but and then I decided I had better things to do with my life. Okay. Okay. A screwdriver. Ah, oh, that's the trick. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Okay, so is everyone following me there? 
Okay, so we got this hydrogen bonding. This hydrogen bonding is really important to living organisms. Obviously, you got things like um, I can't remember what its technical name is, but people call it the Jesus lizard, the one that can run across the surface of the water. Right? Okay. It gets that like he gets this like windmill action going with the legs. Right? But they've got feet that are kind of splayed out. Okay. Their 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 toes kind of spread out. They're almost webbed. Okay. And they can actually support themselves for an instant, at least long enough to get a push on the surface tension of the water. You or I can't do that because we're too heavy. Right? As soon as we touch the water, we break the surface tension and fall in. All right. Eight steps, yeah. I said Mythbusters was trying something like that one day. I never watched the whole thing, but it just looked like they were getting really wet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the the surface tension can can support small things uh, like water striders and, and things like that. Have you ever seen those bugs? They kind of like got four legs and they just they sit on the top of the water, right? Well, they're small enough they don't disrupt the surface tension. Now, if you want to play like cruel games, just drop a rock right next to them. Because that will break the surface tension of the water, and they'll sink. Right? Yeah. So it's it it only works as long as nothing's disrupting the surface tension. You very rarely see those things on the water if it's windy and there's ripples on the water. Right? It disrupts the surface tension, and they can't stay afloat. All right. So um, it's fine as long as the water is perfectly still. It's the same thing with a glass of water that you've managed to fill slightly over the top. If you flick the side of the glass, it's done. Right? That vibration disrupts the hydrogen bonds, the surface tension goes away, and that water dribbles over the sides. All right? So the hydrogen bonds are there, but they're weak. But they can reform really, really quickly too. All right? They're weak, they break easily, but they reform really easily too. This can be used by plants to transport water from their roots to their leaves. Okay? They've got to be able to pull water against gravity through their stems or trunks or whatever, if they're depending on the size of the plant, all the way up to the leaves. That's sometimes maybe even 100 meters if you're dealing with you know, like a giant redwood or something like that. They've got to transport it a long way. So what they have to do is use these hydrogen bonds to link them together. How many people played with like a barrel of monkeys before? Right? And they got the little arms and legs that link together the tails. Okay? That's kind of like what happens in a tree. The hydrogen bonds will form and the water will pull it up like links in a chain. Okay? So the, the, the leaves create kind of a pulling force, which we'll talk about in the bio unit. But they create a pulling force and because all of these water molecules are hydrogen bonded together, it can pull them up the tree. Now, we're not talking about huge volumes of water. Okay? These columns of water are in tiny microscopic tubes. Because okay? if the tubes are too big, the water column is too heavy and the hydrogen bonds will break. They're not strong enough. They're strong enough if the tubes are incredibly small. Right? It's the same reason why you can't uh, take like a straw that's got you know this gauge, right? It's like huge, and hope to draw water up that straw. You can't create enough suction to support a column of water that big because it's too heavy. Right? Smaller the straw, the easier it is. Yes, you don't pull up as much volume all at once, okay? but you can still support that small column of water with the help of hydrogen bonding. Okay, so the water molecule is shaped almost like a right angle. Okay? So you can actually get four of them to bond to each other. All right? Four or five even sometimes. Okay? Um, so you've got four bonding places on one water molecule. Okay, four places where hydrogen bonds can occur and hold the molecule together. Okay, and it's roughly like we said, a right angle. Why do you suppose you get this right angle? How come those hydrogen atoms aren't right together? Right, they're both positive. Right, so they they won't they don't want to be too close to each other. They repel slightly. Okay, so they push each other apart to about a 90 degree angle. Right, why aren't they like this? Well, because you got all these electrons down here that are kind of creating a pushing force as well, and that positively charged nucleus of the oxygen atom doing the same thing. So it kind of pushes them to a certain angle. All right. Now, one other thing you probably noticed about water, unlike most things. When water freezes, it gets, well, no, most things get harder when they freeze, but it expands. Yeah, it gets bigger, right? If you've ever, you know, frozen a bottle of water, right, you know that the bottom bulges out on the bottle and then it doesn't sit right after that, okay? That's because water, being a polar molecule, expands when it becomes a solid. Here's why. 
At about 4 degrees Celsius, water is at its most dense in its liquid form. It is more dense than its solid form. That is exceptional. Right? Everything else, you put a solid, its solid form in its liquid form and the solid form sinks to the bottom because it's more dense. Right? But ice obviously floats on water. It's kind of important. If ice didn't float on water, lakes would freeze from the bottom up and fish would never survive over the winter. Right? Okay, it's, it's handy that water floats on itself okay, in its solid form because that keeps the water underneath. So here's what happens. You get to this point. This is as close together as water molecules will want to get. If you cool it anymore, they start to repel because you start getting these negative ends too close together, these positive ends too close together. And just before it freezes, there's like an elastic rebound effect that pushes them away and then it solidifies, less dense than its liquid form, okay? And so you get that crystal kind of shape. Everybody with me on that? Okay, that's also why two, no two snowflakes are alike. The way those water molecules twist and push away from each other makes a unique crystal form every time it happens. All right now, have in the entire history of the Earth two snowflakes looked alike? I'm sure, okay? It's just an expression, but obviously you could look at a lot of snowflakes and probably not find two that looked exactly the same because this process is very random. Right? And the crystal formation is different every time. So, like we said, with the uh, hydrogen bonds, okay, we get this expansion, okay, and the water takes up more space uh, in its liquid form. Something we have to be mindful of when we're freezing things, because if we fill them too full, the container is likely to crack or shatter, okay, depending on what it's made out of when you freeze it. Okay. You ever notice how whenever you buy anything liquid, it's never filled all the way to the top? Eh, there's a reason for that. Right? If it ever were to freeze, you've got to make sure that there's enough room for the expansion of the fluid so that the container doesn't break. All right. Um, so the hydrogen bonds can break very easily, but they also reform. Okay? When we have water hydrogen bonded to itself, we call that cohesion. Okay? So cohesion is water hydrogen bonded to itself, like cooperate, right? It's you're working together, it's working together, it's bonded to itself. Now, it's also possible for hydrogen bonds to form between different polar molecules, right? So the inside of a tree is also made of polar substances. And so water can bond to those, hydrogen bond to those polar substances. Okay? If it's water bonded to something other than water, we call it adhesion. Right? Just like adhesives stick two different things together. So adhesion is to stick two different things together. Cohesion is to stay together as a unit with things that are like you. Okay, so here's what we got. Inside the tree trunk, each one of these little dots here represents a water molecule. Okay. Some of the water molecules hydrogen bond to the inside of the trunk, and they all hydrogen bond to each other. All right? So here you can see that process of adhesion. The water molecule is hydrogen bonded to the inside of the Excuse tree. Excuse but can we have grade 10 students with the last name starting K to Q head to the cafeteria and bring your pictures? Thank you. Okay. Um, here... Between the two water molecules, we have cohesion. It's still a hydrogen bond. Okay? Hydrogen still involves bonded to something else. Okay? But one is water to itself. The other is water to the inside of the tree or anything else. Okay? Everyone follow me on that one? Okay? So that's an important thing. We'll talk about that several times, but that's a great example of nature using hydrogen bonding for a specific purpose. It might be one you would want to use if you were explaining the polar nature of water on an exam. Right? So it's a it's a good diagram to kind of remember. Oh man. Language. Holy smoke. Okay. Um so remember here, another definition that we got to know, adhesion, okay, clinging of a substance to another, okay, also plays a role as water adheres to the wall of vessels, okay, preventing it from falling from the pull of gravity. 
Okay. Surface tension also causes those big bubbles to form on the surface of leaves. Same as uh, I was talking about that you know, if you wax your car, you get those bubbles that form on the, on the surface of the paint because it's not penetrating. But those bubbles can only get so big before they lose integrity, right? It's just that there becomes too much water and the hydrogen bonds aren't strong enough to hold that much water together and they run off, right? Okay, so the, the, the tension breaks and they run off or they form smaller ones afterwards. Right? Now, why do you suppose plants put a waxy coating on their leaves? Hmm? Protect them? Um, not really. We want, I mean, plants want water, right? If they're alive, they don't have to worry about water rotting them. They need it, okay? But the thing is, they don't want water to get out. So the wax works both ways, right? And the, the fact of the matter is, the leaves can't absorb water. They have no tissue capable of absorbing water through the leaves. Where do plants absorb their water? the roots. So if you make your leaves covered with this waxy material, you keep the water in the leaves and any water that falls on the leaves will run off down to where the ground is to the roots and the roots can absorb it. So it really works really well. It's, you know, nature working. Okay. Um, so that's why they had this kind of waxy cuticle, which we'll talk about in the next unit as well. Okay, so the interface between water and air has this ordered arrangement. If you could see the water molecules, you could actually see that they're a set distance apart. The hydrogen bonds are there, and they're holding it in that formation, creating the surface tension for the little water striders, okay, or the Jesus lizard, okay, things like that, that are capable of staying on the surface without falling through. Right? The closer to 4 degrees Celsius water is, the more surface tension it's going to have. No, I can't remember its taxonomic name. I don't remember what it is. That's what everybody calls it, the Jesus lizard, because it can run across the water. Yeah, would be. Nicknames are always cooler than your real name, though. Well, unless your nickname is Stinky. Then I suppose probably not. But. Okay, is that making sense to everybody? All right, um, you got about uh, seven or eight minutes left in class here. My suggestion would be to talk to your group members about possibly figuring out some of the identities of your unknown compounds, see if you can put heads together and maybe figure out some of those with what's left of the class time.